Welcome everyone back to The Sovereign Way. My name is Elizabeth and our experiment today is on survivor guilt. It's an unconscious, subtle resistance that you have to really resting in the truth that it is okay to be okay. I'm going to start with a vulnerable story today, which isn't my usual way, but today I'm going to start with a vulnerable story. We were three little girls, Anna and Sarika and I, and we lived in a little mountain town in Norway. Me and Anna were English and Sarika was Irish, and growing up together in this cold environment and culture, our traditions seemed so weird to other people, and they made sure that we knew that we were different. But that was okay, because we were like a secret club. It was as if we were the only three girls in the whole world who knew what it was like to be different and foreign and weird, as we played with the dolls in our treehouse. And then when we were six and a half, Sarika died. It was a bitter cold morning and she was walking to meet her dad on his way home from work. And she slipped on the ice and she fell into the stream and the frozen water took her away. And Anna and I had lost Sarika, just like that, gone. And Anna and I actually lost many more of our friends dying throughout our childhood. Classmates died in car accidents, drowning in the lake, there was suicide, there was cancer. And we also noticed this strange sort of one-upmanship in illness as well in, in the society where we lived. People would sort of compare diseases and they would share stories of woe. They would manifest mysterious illnesses and disorders. And in fact, in fifth grade, there were four kids in my class with full blown diagnosed arthritis. Arthritis in elementary school. And it was just accepted that life itself was this daily gamble. And by the time I was 20, I knew death intimately, and I often wondered why he wouldn't take me. I gave him many opportunities, challenging death. Now, Anna and I eventually, when we were grown women, when we were 20 odd years old, we both chose to leave Norway and go to our homeland, England, for university. She went to Sheffield and I went to Lincoln and we visited each other for tea parties and to go night clubbing and call fit boys and stuff like that. And then halfway through the summer after our first year, I got a horrible phone call from her mum to say that Anna had been killed, hit by a drunk taxi driver. And just like that, I was the only one left. I was the only one left. Now that was 20 years ago now, gosh, you know, how, how time flies, eh? But I could never bring myself to really tell her parents how profoundly sad I was that Anna had died because who was I to complain when they had such a burden? They had it so much worse. So I was ashamed of the blessing upon my life. And for a really long time, it caused me to deny the many extraordinary blessings and privileges that I was swimming in on a day-to-day -day basis. And instead, my attention would always point into the trauma and the hardship as a way of balancing anything good. I could no longer take delight in the simple things. I had to do something spectacular and meaningful and world changing to justify having the wealth of grace that I do. There is a subtle shame lurking in the privilege of survival. And although we yearn for and pray for and crave and claim and create and architect and master the life of beauty and accomplishment, the unspoken cultural agreement that only suffering qualifies growth prevents us from truly 
resting in the peaceful reality of deliverance. To many of you, how much you've struggled or suffered or overcome or worked is linked to how much you're allowed to receive. To many of you, it's almost impossible to celebrate the miracles in your life without also saying, boy, did I have to work hard to get here. You should have seen what I've been through. I've earned my scars. I've done so much inner work. I've had a lot of trauma in my life. I've trained, I've developed, I've done it all. Many of you are collecting ascension symptoms to prove your spiritual maturity. Many of you are soaking up all the misery of the world so you can prove your empathic relevance. Many of you are working 60 hour weeks or more so you can feel justified in having wealth. But earning your blessing through struggle and hardship is energetically the opposite of deliverance. And when someone asks you, how did you get this consecrated life of abundance and beauty? It's much more glamorous to say through blood, sweat and tears than to say, by the grace of God. This is a much more feminine way. I receive just because. The true answer, of course, is that you don't know why or how you've been developed the way you have or placed in this position that you have. It's a mystery. But we can call it chosen. Can you accept being chosen? I'd like you to type something in. Here in the Oasis, or if you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook, type in the comments, but you get to choose what to type. Either I am chosen to affirm what you know, or type am I chosen to open the inquiry further and find out what he says to you. Type it in, either I am chosen or am I chosen? Both choices equally fruitful, by the way. If you are delivered and your life becomes heaven, then your badass overcoming of hardship and grueling inner work and outer accomplishment and impact will begin to dissolve. And that story will begin to mean much less to how you identify. You'll stop trying to be relatable. You'll stop hungering for success. You'll stop striving for enlightenment. You'll be peaceful and simple. And it'll look really strange to a world that's addicted to the self-congratulatory endorphin rush of counting drops of blood shed for the sacrifice of your blessing. Good, it's coming in. I am chosen. I am chosen. I was chosen. Am I chosen? Am I chosen? I am chosen. Choose how to rest in that question. Now I acknowledge the sacredness in hardship. I acknowledge the solidarity in suffering together. I acknowledge the tender holiness of a compassion that only comes when you have also known pain. But this isn't an experiment on pulling through and making it. This is an experiment on deliverance and deliverance is a choice to receive. Are you willing to be chosen and lifted up and carried away and refreshed and restored, not because you earned it, 
not because you earned your survival, but just because you're loved. I'm going to share my favorite story from the Bible today. It's a story of two women who I know very, very well indeed. But before I do, let me dwell just for a brief moment on what the Bible is and how I'll be using it in this journey of deliverance. The Holy Bible is a mysterious collection of stories and poems and historical accounts, manifestos of law and order, epistles of promise and magic. And together, they tell a story from the beginning of time of a people struggling with God. From the quantum creation dynamics at the genesis of human consciousness, to a family of men and women in a generational wrestling match between their divinity and their humanity. The name Israel means the one who struggles with God. And the first part of the Bible, the, the original testament, is a rich tapestry telling a story of linear consciousness, a linear consciousness enslaved to the energetic cycles of oppression and liberation, conquest, trauma, healing, defeat, victory, complaining, surviving. It's this wild human ride for a heart and mind desperate for enlightenment and freedom, but subject to the laws of attraction, karma, and covenants. And the second part of the Bible, the New Testament, tells the story of deliverance from that cosmic system of energetic cause and effect. It tells the mystery of salvation, to be freed from the prison of constant vibrational influence, allowed to finally rest in heaven, here and now, even before perfect order has been made manifest. And so as we go along in this journey of deliverance together, I'll be using the Bible often. It's a magic book. Where is my Bible? It's a magic book, it's alive, it's living and it's active. And although it is created in space and time, it's not locked in space and time, it's as alive today as it has ever been. And each verse that we'll play with is a hyperlink that opens your heart to deeper revelation. Now, if you read this book with linear eyes and a judgmental mind, and you have many stories that you're playing with about Christians and what they're like and about Jews and what they're like and about witchcraft and homosexuals and patriarchy and exploitation rife in the church, then you'll only see ink on paper and you'll be able to justify any judgment that you'd like to make. You could say, is it okay for me to murder my neighbor over a dispute? And you would find biblical evidence that that's okay. Is it okay to ostracize, oppress, exclude, manipulate, exploit? I can, find, I can find evidence to justify anything I like by isolating sentences made out of ink on paper. But if I read this book with my heart engaged, my mind in God and my roots deep in the body of mother, then I am in love. And those verses are not linear ink on paper, but they are a quantum response to that reverberating song of my heart's inquiry. This is the living word of God. So in this series, I will be using stories from the Bible to invoke remembering and to demonstrate different metaphysical qualities and dynamics. I'll also use archetypes and I use vibrational healing transmissions through beautiful prayers and spells that are hidden in this book. And I'll be using multiple different translations for different reasons. People often ask me, what's your favorite translation? And I couldn't tell you, they all have their characteristics and their magical qualities. I'm not going to be offering a scholarly examination of who wrote what, 
and which historical and geographical accounts are contested by which scientific expeditions. I'm not going to do that, but I encourage you, if you're interested, to explore as much as you like. Here, this is 100% magic. Let's get back to survivor guilt. And I'm gonna share with you the story from the Bible of these two women, these two women that I know very well, Martha and Mary. Their story, in fact, this particular story is told in two parts. One of the parts of the story is told in one gospel and another piece is told in another gospel. In fact, it's, um, can someone write this down? Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. And John chapter 12, verses one to eight. So these are the two pieces of the story that I'm gonna be bringing together. The first is from Luke. And this story is titled, At the Home of Martha and Mary. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about so many things, but only few things are needed, or indeed, only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. We understand Martha's point of view. I've worked my butt off over here. But let's for a moment put ourselves in Mary and feel that burning shame of being guilted for having chosen the better. Imagine being full to the brim from a feast of celebration, resting at the feet of the king your shoulders down, breathing slow, your belly soft and round, basking in the glorious embrace of his voice. And then feeling that bony finger of accusation pointing in from the outside saying, you haven't earned that yet. There's much more to do. Feeling your, your cheeks burning with shame as the desire you have to walk away from the dirty dishes is illuminated in Martha's words. There's still so much to do and the others are working so hard. And the savior says, you are worried about so many things, but only few are needed. In fact, only one thing is needed to rest in the presence of love, to choose the better. And I guarantee it will not be taken away from you. When this story is told again in John, there's another nuance, which is equally valid to this point of survivor guilt. And this is in John 12, verses one to eight. And the title of this one is called, Jesus is anointed at Bethany. And it goes like this. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, the one that Jesus had raised from the dead. And here a dinner was given in Jesus's honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of pure spikenard, an expensive oil, and she poured it on Jesus's feet and she wiped his feet with her hair. 
and the whole house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, the one who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's a, a worth a year's wages. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. This here and now is what the oil is for. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Be in that lavish, sensual devotion of bending down to wrap your hair around his feet, dripping with oil, soaking in that rich aroma, that moment of sacral tenderness and vulnerability in a divine intimacy that is so submitted, so sexual and holy and costing a great worldly wealth. And there's that bony finger of accusation and guilt again, saying, I should be spending this money in this time in a more sensible way because there are others who are worse off. And the savior says, leave her alone. Go away, guilt. There will always be someone who's worse off. And it is not on you to carry the burden of your survival. About a month ago, my husband Matt and I were out for a drive. And at the bottom of the Walmart driveway sat a little old lady and she was all huddled up, all bent over herself and she was holding out a dirty hand. And the cars were driving by and they were splashing her, and she looked the very hollow of misery. So Matt stopped the car and I hopped out and I went and sat down next to her. She must have been like 65 years old or so. She was just a thin skeleton draped with sunburnt skin. Her hair was falling out and she had a worn Bible by her side. And I wrapped her up in my arms and I asked, what's happening to you? And she said, She'd spent the last three years living with her mum in their mobile home, and she'd been tending to her mum in her final years. And then when her mama had died, she spent their money on her last rites, and then got a letter to say that the mobile home park was being sold and she had to leave. And now she lives in a car in the Walmart car park and sits by this puddle begging for food. I asked her about her support system and she told me that her sister lived in a faraway state and was sickly herself so she had no family to help but she said she did know of a soup kitchen in Bradenton that she could go to but it, it just didn't feel right she would be guilty because there are so many others worse off. She was her little mother's baby once toddling about at the hearth of the kitchen, smelling the sweet smell of stewing apples and listening to the sound of family. And now she was a skeleton in a puddle, unable to claim a seat to recline at the table in the warmth of the soup kitchen because there are others worse off. So we cried together because I know what it's like to survive. And I prayed over her and I laid hands on her and I gave her money for food and water. But most importantly, I gave her permission to go to the soup kitchen so that her deliverance could begin. It was her time to be saved. She has chosen the better and it will not be taken away from her. Last week, I asked the question, is it safe to be delivered or do you have to be self-sufficient? And I know that we all know 
that our hard work and our self-sufficiency is awesome when we're badass independent CEO boss bitches, but that same pride, it will drive you to the point of being a skeleton in a puddle unless you release the need to earn your survival, your ascension, your place at his feet in heaven. Because when you're delivered, you live a consecrated life where there is only life and life abundantly. You've survived and it's okay. It won't be taken away from you. So this week, I ask you to release the need to suffer along in solidarity with a falling world. I ask you to release the need to justify your beauty and your wealth, your abundance and your peace by juxtaposing it with the misery and the trauma and the hard work that you had to sacrifice to get here. And I ask you to instead, go and take your place once and for all among the chosen, the family of true believers committed to life ever after. There's only one more thing I'd like you to type in today. I'd like you to type in, I am Martha. And I am Mary. And let these affirmations be an alchemy that bring these two archetypes together and integrate them once and for all so that you can take your place in the kitchen. The question you're swimming in in this week, and you've typed that in, is it coming? Yes, it's coming. I am Martha. I am Mary. And the question that you're swimming in this week is, am I chosen? Am I chosen? And I want you to allow all the discomfort in that question to come and be seen and be released. And see if you trust that it's okay to end the story of the one who struggles with God. And trust that deliverance has already happened. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, wherever you are. It helps so much in getting the message out. Now I'm gonna turn off the live stream and open the table here in the Oasis. Thank you for being here.